So um, earlier we, we mentioned about blockchain. A lot of people are familiar with the blockchain technology, the distributed ledger through this, the, the crypto space. Um, and because I came in the door of education and that they wanted to put preschoolers on blockchain as a human capital commodity, I was never a fan. <laughs> the way a lot of people who have been dabbling in crypto um, have for quite a number of years. But I understand all of the many other versions of blockchain that are coming um, from beyond education transcripts, but the healthcare records, the digital driver's licenses, and even things as crazy sounding as brain computer interface information run on blockchain. So this is the section I wanna to touch a little bit on about consciousness, because I think essentially their intention of remaking us as machine readable organized information is that the blockchain technology is central to that. And like the neural transfers in our mind. So on the one side I have um, the science of consciousness and uh, Tucson has been a center for consciousness studies since the mid 90s, which is really interesting and Stuart Hameroff is one of the key figures in that. And then on the other side of the screen um, is a section of a paper from Melanie Swan. Uh, she's uh, at Purdue University and also I'm not sure if it's the London School of Economics, but her focus is essentially creating minds using blockchain, and she calls them cloud minds. And this idea that we will enter into communal minds with other people or possibly other things and have it mediated on blockchain so that the intellectual property that we offer up with while we are in a cloud mind is properly credited up to us and for some future program. And I think this has to do with planned teaming and the telepresence labor economy that they're looking to craft eclectic teams of people with different life experiences to look at their complex problems um, in new ways. And that blockchain is a way of tracking your intellectual property contribution across time is what's coming. And this, this paper from her is from 2016. So these are things um, most people can't even imagine that it's a possibility of something we should be concerned about or talking about, um, but they are, are Real. So um, I mentioned that early, earlier, the clip with the Russian billionaire talking about 20, 2045, the you know, whole body prosthetic. Well, Hamroff is, is signed up, from, aligned with that program. Um, I think when you imagine the idea of putting our mind into a remote robot, which is the next phase of telepresence global labor, um, at the top, that's from Sanctuary AI, that's based out of Burnaby in um, outside, of, it's a suburb of Vancouver, and Suzanne Gilder, essentially you have a VR headset and haptic controllers that remotely activate a robot, and that's called piloting, and that's, they're imagining a future where like many retail service workers, um, swap out between an AI interaction and a human pilot. Um, and so, but meanwhile, all of that data, like as we're inhabiting the body and moving our body and moving its body, it's like learning us, learning how to be that kind of person. Uh, there's a less humanoid version that's in Japan. They, they say it's being used to stock cooling things in like convenience stores, but again, like why not just give like a high school kid that job, you know? But that that's the future that is sort of coming. And I think a lot of it is about this sort of mind-body problem and consciousness and embodiment, like they're trying to give the robots bodies and make us into mind, like digital mind files. Um, on the blockchain, this is something that's come up within the past year, is this idea of a soul-bound token. Again, they're pretty obvious about what they're saying. Um, this is in contrast to an NFT or a non-fungible token in that it's not an object that can be transferred or sale or sold as a, as a digital item, uh, as a unique digital asset, but rather it is bestowed upon you and it can be revoked. But my understanding of these soul-bound tokens is that they would say it would be something like you attend this conference today and boom, 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 I like award you all soul bound tokens in your digital wallet that you were here. And so forever on after, unless I revoke it, it's known. And my understanding of these as I see them is that these are metadata tags uh, for digital identities and so that they can pull that and it will be linked to things like uh, interventions with human capital finance, right? That they do an intervention with a preschooler and then they'll be able to track it 35 years later if they end up in drug rehab or something like that. It's this layers of tokens. Um, Glenn Weil, he's the guy at the top. He's the Microsoft's Octopest. <laughs> and this other woman below, uh, 
uh, Puha Olhaver, I think, and Victalik Buterin. But they're the people who were chosen to front this concept, but I think really it probably goes back at least to the 1990s and sort of early smart contracting. This is uh, supposedly a leaked video from Google called The Selfish Ledger. It's sort of about Lamarckian uh, epigenetics as a contrast to neo-Darwinian evolution, and I believe that this is your blockchain mind file. When we use contemporary technology, a trail of information is created in the form of data. When analyzed, it describes our actions, decisions, preferences, movement, and relationships. This codified version of who we are becomes ever more complex, developing, changing, and deforming based on our actions. In this regard, this ledger of our data may be considered a Lamarckian epigenome, a constantly evolving representation of who we are. This is Bill Hamilton, one of the most significant evolutionary theorists of the 20th century. His work studying the social structures of ants, bees, and wasps had a profound effect on our understanding of the role of genes in social behaviors such as altruism. He believed and went on to prove that the driving force behind evolution was not the individual, but the gene. He stated that the ultimate criterion which determines whether a gene will spread is not whether the behavior is to the benefit of the behavior, but whether it is to the benefit of the gene. In this model, the individual organism is a transient carrier, a survival machine for the gene. What if the ledger could be given a volitional purpose rather than simply acting as an historical reference? What if we focused on creating a richer ledger by introducing more sources of information? What if we thought of ourselves not as the owners of this information, but as custodians, transient carriers, or caretakers? Initially, the notion of a goal-oriented ledger may be user-driven. As an organization, Google would be responsible for offering suitable targets for a user's ledger. Whilst the notion of a global good is problematic, topics would likely focus on health or environmental impact to reflect Google's values as an organization. Once the user selects a volition for their ledger, every interaction may be compared to a series of parallel options. As this line of thinking accelerates and the notion of a goal-driven ledger becomes more palatable, suggestions may be converted not by the user, but by the ledger itself. In this case, the ledger is missing a key data source, which it requires in order to better understand this user. In order to plug the gap in its knowledge, the ledger begins searching for a device which delivers the required data when used. From this list, the ledger begins sorting the options most likely to appeal to the user in question. In situations where no suitable product is found, the ledger may investigate a bespoke solution. By analyzing historical data, it is increasingly possible to discern qualitative information such as taste and aesthetic sensibility, which may be used in the creation of a design proposal. With the advent of technologies such as CNC milling and the emergent possibilities of 3D printing, a custom object may be created to trigger this user's interest. In this way, the ledger is able to plug gaps in its knowledge and refine its model of human behavior. User data has the capability to survive beyond the limits of our biological selves in much the same way as genetic code is released and propagated in nature. By considering this data through a Lamarckian lens, the codified experiences within the ledger become an accumulation of behavioral knowledge throughout the life of an individual. By thinking of user data as multi-generational, it becomes possible for emerging users to benefit from the preceding generation's behaviors and decisions. As new users enter an ecosystem, they begin to create their own trail of data. By comparing this emergent ledger with the mass of historical user data, it becomes possible to make increasingly accurate predictions about decisions and future behaviors. As cycles of collection and comparison extend, it may be possible to develop a species-level understanding of complex issues such as depression, health, and poverty. As these streams of information are brought together, the effect is multiplied. New patterns become apparent and new predictions become possible. Just as the examination of protein structures paved the way to genetic sequencing, the mass multi-generational examination of actions and results could introduce a model of behavioral sequencing. As gene sequencing yields a comprehensive map of human biology, researchers are increasingly able to target parts of the sequence and modify them in order to achieve a desired result. As patterns begin to emerge in the behavioral sequences, they too may be targeted. 
the ledger could be given a focus, shifting it from a system which not only tracks our behavior, but offers direction towards a desired result. We are at the very beginning of our journey of understanding in the field of user data. By applying our knowledge of epigenetics, inheritance, and memetics to this field, we may be able to make mental leaps in our understanding, which could offer benefits to this generation, to future generations, and the species as a whole. So over lunch, I had somebody who was sort of asking like what the goal was or what the incentive of, was for rich people, you know, to do these things. And, you know, I think that there is some something <laughs> out there that believes that it needs to use us as an armature to like build out some sort of superhuman, su super organism <laughs> that exists. And um, when you understand things as a goal-driven ledger, with prediction and risk and guiding. This is all stuff I wanna keep you to keep in mind the next section when we look at the ant computer. The way in which we can be guided through the sensor technology in ways that we don't even realize. And you know, I've I've had situations happen to me over the last couple years of you know, being in social media circles with, with people that I thought I knew that all of a sudden have some unexpected behavior. Uh, things happen that, that aren't logical, like in the real world. And so you have to wonder as we navigate this information um, landmines, you know, all of how this steering is happening and that the goal is to track all outcomes. Like they don't actually really mind that there's lot, that there is resistance, right? As long as they can track it and calculate it into the program, they, they're fine with some resistance. And so I think that's why I feel like in, it matters the story that we inhabit the story that I'm offering you for you to try on and consider is that this is a game, it's a eugenics-based game of sort of super evolutionary processes that are digitally mediated that most people aren't aware of and that are being gamed at every level tied to finance and social control and our innermost relations and our consciousness. And that's a very different conversation. I think if we tried on that lens and more people were exploring that with relation to Web3, the outside-in robot and blockchain tokens, uh, we would be a little bit farther along and really understanding how to better navigate the labyrinth. So just in closing, that these are some papers. Um, Stuart Hameroff, he was already working on biomolecular consciousness and nanotech in the late 80s. <laughs> You know, I, I'm sure, I mean, and this is stuff that's not top secret, right, that the public can get. So, like, imagine the other stuff that's out there. Um, he and Roger Penrose have this idea of co quantum consciousness that's connected to sort of microtubules and this idea that consciousness is sort of an emergent thought layer that's in line with uh, Talhard Desjardins. Uh, who posited the omega point in Christogenesis, and uh, Vladimir Vernadsky who was a biogeochemist. So these ideas have been floating out there since the 20s and 30s. They're just trying to access it. Um, so one of uh, the, the a lot of money has come in from the Fetzer Institute for this work on consciousness and the John Templeton Foundation. The Templeton Foundation is located outside of Philadelphia. John Templeton made his money in mutual fund creations. He gave up his US citizenship in the 80s, moved to the Bahamas, became a British citizen, was knighted by the queen, and his foundations fund high-level physics, uh, free markets, genius, character development, and religion. And so this is very important for all the people out there who imagine themselves sort of conservative, libertarian patriots. Um, the guys who are running the Blockchain Mindfall Project, they're really interested in all of that too. <laughs> um, John Fetzer, actually he grew up in uh, studying radios. He was self-taught in a radio pioneer. He made a bunch of money in Michigan. He's based out of Kalamazoo for many years. He owned the Detroit Tigers. He was a beloved figure on paper. He was raised Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, he was a uh, Presbyterian for business purposes, but he was deeply involved in spiritualism, in um, channeling, in Ouija boards, um, in all sorts of stuff. And so a Fetzer's Institute is involved in all of that. But again, centered on love and peace and all of that. But if you substitute the world homeostat for peace, you get a little bit more of an angle. Um, so they're both pouring money into these works. Uh, the Temple Foundation at, at the bottom, that's, that's an image from the Berggruen Institute. M Nicholas Berggruen is a billionaire financier slash philosopher who wants to build a monastery outside in the Santa Monica Mountains. And um, he's studying uh, early modern magic with a UCLA emeritus professor. Like, you can't make this 
stuff up. So the thing is, Fetzer actually uh, spent his winters at a ranch in Tucson. Um, if any of you guys know where the Fetzer Ranch in Tucson was, I think it was sold in the 90s after his passing to fund the foundation. Um, but he did a lot of his channeling work um, here in Tucson. And I, I think that there is something to, you know, there is stuff about magnetism and frequency and waves and, um, uh, clearly it feels like southern Arizona is a center for a lot of these energetics. So anyway, just another part of your labyrinth. 